The Case of Mrs. Hillier Many years ago, the exigencies of business compelled me to reside for several months at the town of Landau in the Bavarian Palatinate. I found it a peculiarly dull spot, especially in the winter months. Later, when the leaves are green, there are some pleasant excursions to be made in the wooded mountains. A chain of red sandstone hills forms the backbone of the country, and nearly every point of eminence is crowned by the ruins of a castle. Stupendous works they are, some of them. They are all grim records of the feudal ages, when a human life was of little account, and men were sent in gangs, groaning and toiling, with the lash at their backs, to carve the face of the cliff, or to hew dark passages into the solid rock, till they dropped dead from fatigue. There is proud Mattenberg, laid low by the French, whose iron bullets are still fixed in the walls. Trifles, where Richard Cordelion, they say, languished until his romantic rescue by Blondel. Frowning Fleckenstein, celebrated of old in the pages of the Nibelungenlied. Feglenburg, Don, in fact, a region full of knights and dragons and enchantments. The gray mists of the Middle Ages still float about those decayed, pine-girdled fastnesses. After some weeks of loneliness, I became acquainted with a Mr. and Mrs. Hillier, who were, so far as I know, the only English residents in Landau at the time. The acquaintance quickly ripened into friendship. Mr. Hillier had been for some twenty years Professor of Physiology and Comparative Anatomy at the University of New Leeds, U.S. He was now well advanced in years. Mrs. Hillier was a fair lady, wreathed in smiles, and somewhat younger and stouter than her husband. They had apparently settled down to spend the remainder of their lives in Landau, though I soon found out that it was the lady, and not her husband, who had selected this dreary spot. Mr. Hillier, indeed, seemed to dislike it particularly. They were fairly wealthy people, and I was, for a long time, puzzled to explain this curious affection on Mrs. Hillier's part for an obscure German town. A mere accident led to the solution of the mystery. I was sitting one evening alone with Mr. Hillier, and turning over the pages of a large volume that had just arrived by post. It was entitled, A Monograph of the Boa Family, and bore on its title page the written inscription, To His Former Teacher, Professor Hillier, In Token of Friendship and Respect, A. Bellwood. The professor corroborated the fact. A former pupil of mine a great enthusiast of servants. He spent many years in the swamps of South America. These American scientific publications are luxuries, I said, glancing over the pages. The book was open at a magnificent plate, representing a black boa constrictor, whose extenuated lungs seemed to heave with lifelike motion, while iridescent tints played about the dusky coils. It was a masterpiece of the engraver's art, one expected every minute to see the shimmering monster wake into life and glide out of the pictured page. I glanced at the accompanying text. It ran, with pardonable pride, This new subspecies of anaconda, for which I venture to propose the name Eunectes marinus va tartarius, was obtained by me in a single specimen, a male, in the marshy forests bordering upon the upper Brancos River. Nothing can surpass the beauty of its rainbow hues, which only I have hitherto been in a position to appreciate. Unfortunately, the marvelous tints fade rapidly after death. Then followed measurements and other details. I have never seen a black anaconda, I remarked. I have, replied Mr. Hillier. Then Mr. Bellwood is mistaken. Mrs. Hillier at that moment entered the room behind me. She glanced over my shoulder at the engraving and then, to my amazement, uttered a scream of terror and fainted into the arms of her husband, who had hastily risen from his chair. "'My dearest Alice!' he cried in consternation, supporting her, as best he could, out of the room. Presently he returned alone. "'I must apologize,' he said. "'The fact is, my wife cannot endure snakes.' On that evening he volunteered no further information, but during the course of my stay at Landau, I elicited from him a story that offers an adequate explanation of Mrs. Hillier's indisposition. This is what he told me. 
I studied at the renowned University of Dublin. In those days, that was forty years ago, I worked hard, for I had my ambitions. My ambition was to become a great doctor, a benefactor to mankind. I have relapsed, as you perceive, into mediocrity. That is the end of many a promising career. It was not long before I made the inevitable discovery that, owing to the vastness and complexity of subjects, I would be compelled to devote myself as a specialist to one branch or another if I intended to do work of any value. After some deliberation, therefore, I decided to take up the respiratory organs as a particular subject. This, I thought, would soonest bring me into prominence, especially in England, where there is such an appalling mortality from pulmonary complaints. During my preliminary researches, I found nothing so interesting as the lungs of snakes. One can picture to oneself, from the form of a snake, what singularly shaped organs its lungs must be, and under what unusual conditions of compression and simultaneous elongation the work of breathing proceeds. Besides, it is precisely in this class of animals that one meet with some of those curious transitional forms, the boa family, for instance, where two lungs are gradually converted into the single organ of most snakes, generally by the reduction of the left lobe. But these are technicalities. A difficulty arose at the outset of my studies. St. Patrick having banished all snakes from Ireland, I was put to considerable trouble and expense in sending for material for my daily work of dissection from London, Hamburg, and other places. I required large specimens, boa constrictors and other giants, for the smaller individuals did not allow me to carry on with sufficient clearness those minute histological investigations into the lining of delicate blood vessels and so forth, especially with the microscopes of those days. In this dilemma, a fellow student supplied me with a letter of introduction to a Mr. Denbig, a retired naturalist, with whom he used to have dealings some years ago. I found this man's house with some little difficulty. It lay near the end of Wilcox Street, on the outskirts of one of the dirtiest quarters of the town. It was a large, old-fashioned building with a patch of grass in front. The door was opened by a young girl, who I afterwards discovered to be Miss Lenora Moore, an orphan, and Mr. Denbig, niece. She lived alone with her uncle. She was slim, with a plaintive and ethereal expression of countenance that accorded well in her somewhat romantic name. She glanced through my friend's letter and said, I cannot ask you to speak to Mr. Denby at this moment, for perhaps you would care to see some of the larger serpents? Mr. Morris writes that you are interested in them. We ascended some stairs, and entered a room that was stiflingly hot. Along the walls I observed a number of cages containing tropical reptiles. Opposite to that of a large labaria snake from Guinea, a man was sitting motionless. It was Mr. Denby. He was about sixty years of age, sallow, clean-shaven, and dressed in a tight-fitting suit of black material. He made no signs of having heard us. The reptile's head was slightly raised, and Mr. Denby appeared to be looking fixedly into its eye. I laid my letter of recommendation upon a writing-table at his elbow. "'It is useless to interrupt him now,' my companion whispered. "'He is often like this nowadays. He has changed so much lately.' It is horrible, horrible, she added in a yet lower tone. She was evidently not happy in the company of this old man and his strange pets. Descending from this room by another staircase, we found ourselves on the lower floor again. This portion of it had been laid out into cages for some ten or twelve tropical serpents. I ought to have said boudoirs, for that alone gives some idea of the luxurious furniture of these apartments, that contrasted singularly with the impoverished appearance of Mr. Denby and his niece. I learned, long afterwards, that recently, on being appointed her guardian, he had appropriated all her wealth, which was considerable, and employed it in buying new servants from time to time and in fitting up the rooms. We wandered from one to the other of them, and I was lost in admiration over their inmates, an admiration that Miss Moore did not seem to share. Horrible! 
she repeated. And I have to attend to these awful creatures and to feed them at fixed hours and to report on their health. My uncle seldom climbs stairs on account of his heart. He is so different from what he used to be. He threatens to lock me up with them if I disobey. He seems to be a tyrant. Two days ago a python died, and I thought he would have killed me in his rage. Fortunately, it was not one of his favorites on account of its irregular markings. Can you understand that? If Zephro were to die, he would murder me outright. Zephro? I asked. She pointed to a door, closed with a large padlock. That is where he keeps Zephro, she explained. It has not had any food for two months. He pretends to worship it as a kind of holy creature. I never know what he will do from one day to the next. He changes continually. I entered Mr. Denby's room alone, and saw him walking about excitedly. His face was flushed, so far as his pale complexion would allow, as after an abundant meal. He was talking to himself, and seemed to be in an excellent humor. His was a strange physiognomy. It reminded me of something. I knew not what. I have read Mr. Morse's letter, he began, and I'm delighted to welcome you. Hardly anyone comes to see me nowadays. So, you are studying anatomy? I have put aside some preparations out of my museum for you to take home and study at your ease. May they be to you the stepping stones to other knowledge, greater knowledge. I have passed that stage long ago. A wonderful man, Braid. I was barely acquainted with the name for that was at a time when the hypnotic experiments of James Braid were quite new to the scientific world. He continued, I possess a fountain, Mr. Hillier, whence proceeds joy more delicious than wine. Have you never lost to yourself in a fixed gaze? Have you never floated away into another existence, drunk copious wonder drafts of wisdom? He seemed to be bursting with some secret pleasure. You have some magnificent live serpents downstairs, Mr. Denby. So I have, he replied, somewhat surprised. I found out afterwards that he was never aware of my acquaintance with his niece. Only one of them, however, is perfect. And before you pay your respects to Zephro, Mr. Hillier, I should like to say a few words to prepare you for the mysteries of which he is the living symbol. He spoke earnestly. His voice habitually never rose above a cold, sibilant whisper, and his eyes remained fixed upon me. They were long slit and glassy, without any expression, and sunk under deep, bony brows. He said, The sun wanders from east to west. Towns and villages spread from east to west. Civilization progresses from east to west. The east is the old, the west the new. We looked to the West for better things. Zephro, needless to say, comes from the furthest West. I nodded in acquiescence. A word as to markings. In Miocene times, you are aware, the fauna was more striped than nowadays. Stripes are dying out, as you can observe in the color development of many animals between the immature and the adult stages. They break up into bars and spots, and these coalesce to form an eye pattern, a ring. The oscillus is the purest form of ornamentation, even as the circle is the purest line. As a naturalist, you have undoubtedly been astonished at the fact that many varieties of Ophidians, Saurians, and Bactractians, widely separated groups of animals, are striped in the east and become oscillated toward the west. My explanation of this hitherto mysterious phenomenon is very simple. The oscillus represents the eye, and it is the eye, as Braid has shown, whence can be drawn new thoughts, new truths, new life. Zephyro, needless to say, displays the highest form of decorative design. Now let us descend. As he opened the padlock of the door, I found myself looking through a crystal pane into another serpent boudoir, larger and more extravagantly furnished than the others. The first object that attracted my attention was an enormous black boa constrictor 
that wound itself in mighty convolutions about a moderately sized skeleton tree in the center of the room. It was the same anaconda, the Unectus marinus var tartarius, of which Mr. Bellwood has given a description. I saw at a glance that everything possible had been done to assure its health and happiness. Every interstice in the room, except the proper ventilators, had been carefully closed with cotton wool as a protection from drafts. The room was paneled up to a man's height with polished rosewood. Above that, the walls and the vaulted ceiling had been painted al fresco to represent a primeval forest. A delicate attention, with dark green foliage and gaudy birds fluttering along the branches. At one corner, a rivulet of tepid water trickled out of a dolphin's mouth, and breaking in miniature cascades down some terraces paved in the Moors fashion with golden and green mosaics, lost itself at the foot of the tree in a clear round pool. A fine specimen of Victoria Regina slumbered upon its surface. The light fell through double windows, an additional precaution. The inner ones, being split up into small panes of rosy and tint, produced bright patches of color that lay tremulously, like shreds of crimson lace, upon the white marble floor. Here and there were costly silken mats of oriental workmanship. A small silver thermometer marked the temperature, and the heating apparatus of the chamber, situated beneath the floor, could be regulated to a nicety from where I stood by means of a simple screw. Whilst I was contemplating this bizarre establishment, the black monster lazily uncoiled itself and glided into the water. It gave me the impression of relentless ferocity. But there could be no two opinions as to its beauty. The smooth, jet-black skin shone with a lively play of colors, and a series of exquisite ocelli, with emerald centerpiece framed in a ring of cobalt blue, ran down its back in wonderful regularity of design. They appeared to dilate and contract with its heaving breath. Round its neck I observed a necklace of beads of rock crystal, or moonstone, set in gold. A wonderful specimen, I said. And you have done your best to make him feel at home. Might I inquire as to the object of that collar? The necklace? A harmless deceit on my part. He thinks it is for ornament, but it is really only a device for accustoming him to abstinence. I consider it beneath his dignity, as a god, to swallow animals alive. He should partake only of manna and ambrosia. Of course this could not be done all at once. Such little ruses are quite permissible. All human beings practice them upon the object of their worship. He must be nearly thirty feet long, I said. I dare say he could swallow a man. At least there are authenticated instances of these serpents swallowing what was twice as thick as their own heads, thanks to the accommodating capacity of their jawbones. Ah, really? Do you really think he could do so? I have often wondered about this. Perhaps I was wrong. Perhaps he would not disdain to accept a pure offering. Perhaps he ought to wrestle with some warm-blooded victim in order that he might rejoice, like a god, in his strength. He seemed to entertain my idea quite seriously. He looks ferocious. His rage, Mr. Hillier, is even as the all-devouring rage of the sun. His silence symbolizes the stillness of the stars. His convolutions the winding ways of the planet, his temperature, the coldness of the moon, his iridescent flashes, the rainbow, that displays the spectral hues of all things, his blackness, primordial slime and chaos, his protracted length, the distance from untruth to truth. Behold yourself, Mr. Hillier, at the threshold of the mysteries." I began to understand Miss Moore's apprehensions. After this visit, I only met Mr. Denbigh once again. The immediate cause of my coming was to obtain some more material for my studies, but I have often marveled at the strange fate that caused me to select that particular day. It was the 10th of November. An old serving woman answered the bell. I found Mr. Denbigh sitting alone. He was surrounded by books and I observed, with surprise, the necklace of the black boa constrictor lying upon the table at his elbow. He soon led me into another room, the walls of which were lined with cupboards containing innumerable reptiles preserved in spirits. 
This, he explained, is my museum, mausoleum, I should say, where my favorites sleep after death. The Egyptians must have felt the same kind of reverence for their dead as I do. Ah, those Egyptians! On that shelf, Mr. Hillier, you will find an exhaustive series of preparations illustrating the diseases of servants. I imagine it is unique in the world. Come and study it whenever you like. Perhaps it will be of use to you in your pulmonary investigations. But I trust you will soon grow out of that stage. I also used to take pleasure in dissecting limb glands and what not. I have done what is called good work. A brilliant career lay before me. But I realized its futility and chose the thorny path of poverty. Providence, lately, has thrown some money in my lap as a reward, I suppose, of my honest purpose. And his frozen features melted into the semblance of a smile. But it was a strange smile, a stony smile. The corners of his mouth were drawn up into an expression of hard mockery, such as one may see in the faces of many snakes. Yes, that was the secret of his countenance, its resemblance to the snake type, a resemblance further accentuated by the toneless, hissing voice. Long contact with reptiles had presumably modified his physiognomy. You have given your specimens wonderfully lifelike poses, I said admirably. I perceive you agree with Hogarth as to the beauty of serpentine lines. That was an excellent suggestion you made the other day. What suggestion? I asked, wondering to what he could refer. You have forgotten? Yes, I confess I have taken a great deal of trouble with this collection. I used to dissect serpents, but nowadays I find it hard to cut up my favorites with a knife. It seems a kind of outrage upon the dead. Any true lover of snakes will understand. I also dealt in reptiles formerly, but I found it increasingly difficult to part with them. I am an old man. All my friends have either died or deserted me, and thus I am thrown upon the affection of dumb animals. That, at least, is how my love for them began. Nowadays, understanding them as I do, I spare myself nothing in order to gratify their tastes. I try to anticipate their smallest desires. The Egyptians knew why they paid reverence to these creatures. The Orientals, the Mexicans, and all the other enlightened nations of the world, they knew. Are your hypnotic studies progressing? I asked. Better, far better than I ever dreamed. Whatever I may have thought of some of Mr. Denby's theories, he was evidently an original thinker, and a practical worker in some departments. He had anticipated by many years the discovery of certain laws of animal coloration, and he must have studied profoundly the art, an art that has since been completely revolutionized, of preparing lifelike specimens in alcohol. He was a pioneer in this field. His collection was a revelation to me. The museum specimens of those days were brown, shrunken mummies, leathery, shriveled through the action of spirits, and devoid of all semblance to their former state. Mr. Denby's preparations were rounded and plastic and bright in the coloration. The most delicate internal organs were preserved in lifelike condition, and even the tenderest tints, those effervescent blues and reds, were retained in their intensity, presumably by means of a hypodermic injection of some preservative fluid known only to himself. Was it a fact? Or was it imagination? A part of that same design that had led me here on this day. I seemed to hear, in the direction of the cages downstairs, the sound of a low human moan. A terrible suspicion flashed across my mind, and I ran down the stairs, regardless of Mr. Denby's entreaties. The door of Zephro's apartment was ajar, and I saw Miss Moore standing calmly, open-eyed in that chamber of death, she was in a state of trance. The reptile lay partly in the water that magnified its huge dimensions. Its tail, appearing above the surface, lashed angrily to and fro. I lost no time in dragging her out of a danger that a harmless remark of mine had prepared for her, and she told me later that this moment of awakening, when she realized her position, was worse than all the conceivable torments of hell. I can well believe it. Mr. Denbigh himself had followed me hastily, he fell down at the door of the cage. 
We thought he had fainted, but he was afterwards discovered to be stone dead. The emotion, combined with the ravages of a long-standing cardiac disease, had been too much for him. And since that day, Professor Hillier added, my wife naturally objects to the sight of snakes. That is why she has at last persuaded me to settle down here at Landau, because it is one of the few parts of Europe that are absolutely free from them. Your wife? You did not guess. I call her by her second name now. The other one reminds her too much of that awful period. But, I objected, I saw a snake only the other day near Lindenbronn. An unmistakable thrill of delight passed over the professor's features. Is it possible? That is too good to be true. I have never heard of such a thing. I said it was about a yard in length and of reddish color. Ah, the Coronella lavis, a very harmless species. If you are prepared, Mr. R., to assure Mrs. Hillier of that fact, you will make me your debtor for life. It is useless for me to tell her. She knows how I dislike this place, he added elliptically. I gladly volunteered, and we passed into the drawing-room. Alice, said her husband, with an air of concern and gravity, Mr. R. has some information which, I am sorry to say, will not be very agreeable to you. The textbooks are wrong. It is the old story. One writer makes a mistake, and all the others copy from him. I controlled my features and told my story. Mrs. Hillier seemed to take the news very calmly. But within a week the establishment was broken up, and I was once more alone in Landau.